Welcome to yet another episode of Alt Swift X. Today we are reading Tyrion 3, A Game of Thrones. Um, and in this chapter, Tyrion Lannister is at Castle Black with the Night's Watch. He's been up there to just sort of hang out, piss off the edge of the world, that sort of thing. And the chapter begins with him chatting with some of the leaders of the Watch, and eating crabs. Succulent crabs are what they are eating, because we couldn't go a chapter without a food description. Um, so Tyrion's gonna leave soon, is what they're talking about, and uh, Jor Mormont, the Lord Commander's like, oh, it's a shame you're leaving so soon, you're, you're a good bloke, we need more men like you at the Watch. And so Tyrion's like, well, if you need more men like me, I'll, I'll gather up all the dwarfs of the land and send all the dwarfs to go join the Night's Watch. And everyone laughs at that, because of course it's not Tyrion's dwarfism that makes him such a good bloke, it's his mind. Um, and so, and then Alistair Thorne, who's also there, he gets a bit offended by Tyrion's sort of jokes and making fun of, of the Night's Watch, and he says, oh, you're offending the Night's Watch. Uh, uh, and Alyssa, <laughs> Alyssa actually goes so far as to challenge Tyrion to go, if, to go fight. He basically goes, you want to you wanna fight me, bro? Let's go out into the yard and, f and, and fight to, because I'm so offended by what you've been saying about the Watch. Um, and Tyrion makes fun of him. Um, so, like, Alice is like, oh, you know, say, say that again with steel in your hand. And Tyrion says, why, I already have steel in my hand. I have this crab fork, because he's eating the crabs. And then, he, and then Tyrion jumps onto the table and, like, pretends to, like, sword fight Alice a thorn with his little crab fork. And he sort of pokes at Alyssa with the fork. And then Alyssa is so angry and humiliated that he storms out. And everyone's laughing and laughing and laughing. Uh, and Tyrion gets Alyssa's crabs. Uh, so Tyrion's... So more sort of like physical comedy silliness with Tyrion again. Uh, which is kind of fun. Uh, and... Yeah, so everyone laughs and then they keep on chatting and eating crabs. Uh, and Alyssa leaves. Um, and one of the other people there is Bowen Marsh, uh, the Lord Steward, who, who is as round and red as a pomegranate. Because uh, even some of the descriptions of people must needs also be food descriptions. Because uh, we're reading George R. R. Martin. But yeah, so, and then Tyrion's like, well, after Alyssa leaves, Tyrion is like, what, why do you... Come on, this Alistair Thorne guy, why, why do you keep him around? He's such a prick. Like, why do you have him teaching the recruits why don't you just get him to do some shitty job like like um a stable boy or something and and Jill Mormont's like oh well you know he is a knight and you know we don't have many knights and uh you know he 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 fights well um and Jeremy Riker is also there um and Jeremy Riker comments that uh, that Jeremy Riker and Alyssa Thorne had been fighting for the Targaryens in Robert's Rebellion and that, in fact, it was Tyrion, it was Tywin Lannister uh, who gave Jeremy and Alyssa the choice of either dying or being sent to the Watch, and that's how they ended up here. And now Tywin's son, Tyrion, is up at the Watch having a chat with them, so there are some interesting little uh, connections here. Um, and Tyrion makes some comments of about his father. Um... And Jor is like, man, you really, you kind of are making fun of us, though, aren't you, with the Night's Watch? And Tyrion's like, yeah, well, you got to make fun of everything sometimes, otherwise uh, you'll take yourself too seriously. Um, and Maester Aemon, uh, Maester Aemon is also there. And Maester Aemon makes a comment about how he thinks that, uh, he thinks that Lord Tyrion is quite a large man. He calls Tyrion a giant come among us here at the end of the world. Which is a pretty, pretty cool line. Um, we don't really know what it means, but it, I suppose it implies that Tyrion is just important somehow. Um, I mean, some people have all these theories about Tyrion being one of the three heads of the dragon, whatever that means, that he might ride a dragon, whatever that entails. Um, 
But in any case, Amon recognizes something in Tyrium. A giant here at the end of the world. And of course, the end of the world, um, that sort of relates to them being on the wall, which is kind of the edge of the of the civilized world. Uh, but here at the end of the world also perhaps implies that at this point in time, uh, the world is approaching an end, or at least some kind of magical apocalyptic conflictorial thing. Climax is sort of what we're heading towards. Uh, what with the what with the others coming. Although, of course, we're still at book one, so we're not quite there yet, are we? Um, anyway, uh, so Tyrion finds himself at a loss for words after Amon's comment. But he says, oh, you know, Amon, you're so kind. And then Amon mirrors something that Tyrion had said in a funny sort of way. Point, Yeah, banter. There's banter. Uh, anyway, so that happens. Um... And Jaws like, okay, so yeah, you're heading, you're heading back south, Tyrion. We'll, 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 we'll give you an escort. We'll send some men with you to protect you, uh, at, at least uh, down, down, at least to Winterfell. Um, and Tyrion's like, oh, why don't you send uh, my mate, my mate Johnny Snow? Uh, he can say hi to his family again. And Jaws is like, eh, we prefer. I mean, he's a new recruit. We don't want him to. Uh, see his family again so soon. It's better that he forgets about his family and embraces his duty at the Night's Watch. And Jor talks about his own family. He talks about uh, Mage Mormont, who rules Bear Island since since Jorah's dishonor. So, you know, Jorah, of course, left Westeros because he sold slaves, uh, and now Mage Mormont is in charge of Bear Island. Um, and... Tyrion recognizes that Jor is doing him a favor, but he wants a favor in return. So Tyrion asks Jor, "All right, what can I do for you?" Uh, and so Jor says bluntly that the Night's Watch is dying. The Night's Watch is now less than a thousand men. Um, we're not occupying enough castles, and we've got this huge bloody wall to defend. We just don't have enough men to do it. Um, and he talks about how uh, he sent. He sent Benjamin Stark out to search for Yon Royce, Yon Royce's son. Uh, what's his name? Royce, Waymar Royce. Uh, Waymar Royce was lost, so he sent Benjamin Stark to find Waymar Royce, and now Benjamin Stark is lost. It's like when you get like a frisbee stuck in a tree, so you throw like a like a ball to knock the frisbee out, but then you just get the ball stuck in there as well, and then you keep chucking stuff up there until you got like a dozen a dozen fucking things in the tree. That's what's happening. <laughs> that's that's what's happening here with the Night Squatch. Uh, so they got all these lost blokes out in the woods, uh, and they haven't got enough men to sort out their problems anymore, basically. Um, and they also mention they also mention uh, Jor Mormont's Raven watching down with its beady black eyes. I wonder if Blood Raven is in there watching. Uh, but anyway, the point is that they don't have. They don't have enough men, and Jor talks about how Jor, Jor Mormont is getting old and weary, um, and there just aren't enough good blokes at the watch. Like, Alice of Thorn and Bowen Marsh are sort of okay-ish, but all of their recruits are like these sort of sullen boys and tired old men, and most of them just aren't very competent. Most of them are illiterate, and they just aren't good leaders. They aren't good planners. Um, the Night's Watch is turning to shit. Uh, and so Jor Mormont is like, okay, you, you, Tyrion, are the brother of the queen and the brother of, and and the son of, like, the most powerful lord in the Seven Kingdoms, Tywin Lannister, one of. Uh, how about you influence those people to, to help the Night's Watch, to give us more recruits or something? Um, and Tyrion, of course, you know, doesn't really believe that the Night's Watch is important. He doesn't say this, but uh, he feels embarrassed for Jor Mormont. And his his interpretation is that Jor Mormont is trying to make himself feel as though all his years on the Watch are worth something. He's an old man trying to secure his legacy. And Tyrion feels bad that this old man has squandered these years in Tyrion's eyes, has wasted these years on the Night's Watch, an institution which Tyrion thinks isn't very important. Um... So Jor tries to sort of convince Tyrion of, like, the the mystical danger that's coming. So he talks about the winters, and he talks about how um, a long summer means a longer winter is coming, because, of course, you have the irregular seasons, right? Um, 
and he asks Tyrion how many winters Tyrion has lived through, and Tyrion says eight or nine. Um, which so some people have tried to work out the timeline because we know that Tyrion is like is like twenty twenty eight twenty nine years old or something. So people have tried to fit those eight or nine winters into the timeline uh, through Tyrion's lifetime, and it doesn't it doesn't really work out very well. George Martin is a bit rubbish when it comes to to distances sometimes, but also to timings and years and dates and stuff. He plays it pretty fast and loose, which, which you know, is fine. It's not important. Character's more important. Um, but the point is that, that Jor talks about how uh, it's been a really long summer, which means there's going to be a really long winter. And with the winter comes these mystical dangers, which we don't get too specific about at this point, because an ambiguous, non-specific danger threat is scarier, spookier, than something you can see in the light. Which is why you don't really see the alien in the first Alien movie for, like, ages. Um, I saw this weird Korean horror movie recently, though, where, like, you saw the monster, like, you just straight up saw the monster in the light, like, good view. You could see the whole thing, like, right in, like, one of the first scenes. It was weird. It was just the opposite of what you normally see, because the monster was totally visible. I, I don't think it was as scary, but I don't know. Maybe there was some purpose behind that. Anyway, um, so... The darkness is coming. Dark shapes in my dreams. You must make them understand. You must get the king and Tywin Lannister to help support the Night's Watch. Which, of course, they don't. Uh, he also, Yeah, he also mentions White Walkers. The fisher folk near Eastwatch have seen White Walkers on the shore. Uh, so that's uh, scary. But Tyrion also says, Oh, well, the, fishers, the fisher folk of Lannisport often glimpse merlings. So Tyrion is dismissing this talk of mystical dangers. Um, and yeah, he talks about the long night. The long, long darkness that sweeps sweeps down from the north and fucking destroys everyone. Jor is, is believes that that is going to happen. Tyrion does not. So Tyrion's just sort of like, look, all right, I mean, thank you for, for hosting me here. It's been really great. Uh, he doesn't sound very convinced on the whole mystical danger front, but Tyrion says, thank you, Jor. Uh, it's been great. Have to do it another time. Bro fist. Off we go. Uh, so Tyrion heads off. Uh, but before he goes to sleep... Uh, he decides to go up to climb the top of the wall again. Because um, this might be his last chance, he figures. He might never come back to Castle Black, so he decides to go to the top of the wall again. Uh, and, of course, he doesn't go up the stairs, because that would be really unpleasant uh, for his little dwarf legs. Uh, he goes up the elevator, which, by the way, is quite quite a good job of, of medieval engineering, isn't it? I mean, these... These Westerosi, they haven't worked out gunpowder in in about 6,000 years, but they have, um, they've got whatever, whatever winchery you need to make an elevator happen, so props to them. Uh, so anyway, so he goes in the elevator up to the top of the wall. Um, he takes the elevator up, and yeah, he's like, yeah, I'm just gonna go check out the top of the wall. Um, and yeah, there are some, like, guard, Night's Watch people up at the wall, um, and Tyrion decides to walk along the wall, and he walks west, he walks west along the wall, and he talks about the, the dark abyss on either side of the wall, and he describes the height, and he describes the wall itself, and some of the sort of, like, they've got, like, catapults and stuff on top of the wall, and they, and they drop, like, gravel, broken stones along the top of the wall, so it's, uh, more stable to walk on, uh, blah, 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 um, and he sees Jon Snow, Jon Snow, of all people, is patrolling the top of the wall, and Tyrion bumps into him, um, and they have a little chat, um, and they're sort of, they're sort of semi-mates, so they're talking in a sort of friendly way, um, and... Tyrion asks about uh, Jon's training of the other Night's Watch recruits. So I remember there was that whole thing where at first Jon Snow was being all superior and mopey and teenager e, but he recently started to sort of man up and actually do something positive. So he's actually training 
Gren and Pip and Holder and all these guys, the other recruits, and he's doing pretty well uh, so far. John says that um, the other guys are learning how to sword fight better. Uh, and and they keep walking, and Ghost is with John. Ghost the, Ghost the silent direwolf. Uh, Ghost the Friendly Direwolf is walking with John. Uh, and, and Tyrion mentions that he's leaving. Uh, and John's like, oh, maybe you can take some messages to my family when you go past Winterfell. Uh, and he tells Tyrion to tell Rob a sort of a jokey rivalry sort of message about how, oh, you know, Rob may as well take up needlework because I'm going to be running shit up on the wall. <laughs> hey, masculinity. Um, and to Bran, he wants to, he, he tells Tyrion to help Bran, uh, cause he knows that Bran's, you know, crippled and all that, um, and tell Rickon that Rickon, uh, try to explain to Rickon where I've gone, cause of course Rickon is like, like what, like three or four at this point, very young, uh, but anyway, he's like, he's, he's, just, he's just trying to connect with his family, um, um, and Tyrion about about Bran is like, well, I can't really help Bran that much, honestly. I don't know what I can do for him, but you know, I'll give him I'll give him the best words I can give him. Um, and and Tyrion also makes a comment. I know what it is to love a brother, uh, which uh, which refers to Tyrion's relationship with Jaime, which is of course like his only sort of his only positive relationship with his family because his dad hates him and his sister Cersei hates him, but Jaime has always done right by Tyrion. Um, so yeah, so Jon Snow and Tyrion, they shake hands, um, and Tyrion feels oddly touched, um, and they're good mates, and then they leave. So Tyrion, oh yeah, well yeah, but first they stand, they stand at the wall and look out at the darkness and the wild, and they stand upon the edge of the world. Uh, and they describe the forest, the haunted forest, which lies, which lies beyond, and they describe the distance and the darkness, and in that moment, looking out at the darkness and the wild, Tyrion can almost believe the talk of White Walkers. So he was very dismissive when he was sitting eating crabs with Jor Mormont and Pomegranate Bowen Marsh, but when he's standing out in the darkness, looking beyond the wall with his own eyes out in the cold, he can almost begin to believe that mystical dangers truly do threaten the South. Uh, and Jon Snow, meanwhile, is thinking of his uncle. He says, my uncle is out there. Um, and, and he says, Ghost and I will go find him. John wants to go find Benjamin Stark. Um, and Tyrion says that, I believe you, I think you will go and find Benjamin. But Tyrion then also thinks, but who will go find you? When, when Jon Snow is, is the soccer ball in this analogy being thrown at the tree to dislodge the, the ball that was thrown to dislodge the frisbee, who's going to have the fourth ball to knock the third ball out? Uh, but it's, it, it's a good point. Who will... Who will come to save Jon Snow when he goes to save everyone else? Of course, Jon Snow, Jon Snow doesn't get lost beyond the wall uh, yet. Uh, the, the real sort of problem that he has is getting stabbed in the gut 15 times. That's, that's kind of more Jon Snow's problem. Uh, and uh, presumably it'll be Melisandre who resurrects him uh, in the books, but maybe it won't be. Maybe it'll be something else. Maybe it'll be White Walkers. Maybe it'll be Blood Raven, Heart Tree, Weirwood shenanigans. We don't know. That's kind of a tangent, though. <laughs> um, so, so sort of the point of this chapter was to say that uh, it 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 emphasizes that there's there's mystical, dark, cold, wintry dangers beyond the wall, and the Night's Watch is is not up to facing this danger. Uh, and again, we have this sort of old generation, new generation sort of dichotomy again. Like, we've got all these old guys like Joe Mormont and Bowen Marsh who were sort of like, you know, we might have been good back in the old days, but we're sort of getting old now, and we need a new younger generation to step up and keep shit together. Uh, who, which, in this case, is Jon Snow. Jon Snow is going to do a lot to help uh, the Night's Watch. Another thing that's, that's important, Jon Snow, one of his great abilities, like, you don't really think of him as, like, a great, you know, talker, 
or, or diplomat or anything, but but one of his great skills is turning enemies into friends. So, like, he initially was pretty frosty with Tyrion Lannister because the Starks and the Lannisters aren't friends, but Jon makes a friendship with Tyrion Lannister, and Jon was sort of enemies with the other Night's Watch recruits, these, these older boys uh, who hated him and who he hated because of the whole sort of social differences, but Jon manages to make friends with those guys by helping train, uh, train them to be better swordsmen. Uh, and then later on in the series, you know, John is enemies with uh, the wildlings uh, because of that whole sort of ancient cultural enmity. But, you know, Jon Snow falls in love with a wildling and manages to make peace between Night's Watch and the wildlings, sworn enemies, and John manages to make them work together. So that's the wildlings, the recruits, the Lannisters. Jon Snow has made peace between enemies. So I can't help but think the humans and the White Walkers ancient enemies. Maybe Jon Snow could make peace between them. Jon Snow, though he may not look it, is like a great, he has a great ability when it comes to bringing people together, settling disputes, solving differences. So maybe that'll happen with the walkers. Food for for the thinkings. Uh, so thank you for listening to this episode. Uh, we will have more episodes in the future. Cheers.